So how about a round of applause for? Yeah, I I don't think, I don't think, uh, I yeah. There's nothing that even remotely that you know um, substantial. It is the, the quintessential, I think, you know, DNA of Laguna Beach. I think if you live in Laguna Beach, especially nowadays, it's safe to say you go down to Crest. You you know you have a kid has a skimboard on one hand. He's got the soft top, which I didn't have when we were younger. We you know we would surf on our boogies, but uh, so I, I want to I. I we're going to get to, we always talk about the impetus where that spark was. Obviously, there's something that we're always exposed to, but I think your story is, you know, it, it's it's a little more interesting, right? I'll be honest. Yeah. I mean, growing up in Laguna, the first time, you know, and going to high school here, I remember that first, it was like, we're going to the Vic. And I was like, what's the Vic? And people were like, how do you not know what the Vic is? And I had never really been introduced to skimboarding before I, the age of 15, to be honest. And when I first saw skimboarding, it was really funny because it was through the perspectives of my best friends in high school who were the Stinettes. And they were rolling around with the Bryan brothers. I mean, looking back, I was really spoiled. Um, you know, the first time I ever tried to skimboard was Bill Bryan's skimboard. I remember being on the beach like, I don't have a board. And he's like, right there, grab the board, try it. Yeah. So, and you know, and it, as you were asking about that initial spark, it's a really good question, and honestly, I've never been asked it. And um, I actually came home to visit my family when I was in college. And I went to the Vic, and it was the same weekend I was visiting home. And I saw like 10,000 people on the beach and the, the energy, and this was in 2013. And I remember looking around and being, nobody really knows about this. And thinking, here's a community that's so hungry, that has a story that people think is a hobby. Let's be real. You ask somebody what a skimboard is, they're like, oh, you mean that thing, you know, maybe behind the boat or something? They have really no idea how much has gone into this culture that has been, and as, you know, I'm really glad, you know, to see people's reactions to that Sports Illustrated. I mean, I'll be honest, when well, I found I remember, I see, you got to understand, I'm a bit older, but uh, <laughs> I, I remember when Tommy got on the cover and, you know, I was like, okay, that's stupid. It says surf's up, it's a skimboard. Um, yeah, I, and I kind of lived through that. I mean, so, and I, I thought it was one of those things too in the, I started in, I'd say well, late seventies into the eighties. And it's, I think it's so telling. It's one of those things that even you, even skimming, you do it on the beach nowadays, you know, people that are, aren't from here, they're visiting, they stop in their tracks and they're just scratching their heads. They're like, what is this thing you're sliding on and why? Right. Yeah. It's, and I mean, I mean, it goes back to how social media has influenced today's kids kids don't realize when we were younger, we had to beg our parents to buy Sports Illustrated for kids. We had to go to the thing and get these magazines and the the people that were on the cover of these magazines, the people that were in these magazines, we absorbed and we memorized even though we never saw them. And when I'll be honest, when I first found that cover, I was like, wow. And I, and I honestly contribute, I would say, 50% of the confusion to that article. <laughs> and what's crazy is I like that you call confusion. And yeah. they, what's crazy <laughs> is Sports Illustrated has only done four retractions. And this is one of them. And they included it in a retraction. And I tell people it's like that magazine is pretty perfect. And I've worked in newspaper rooms. I don't know if you have, and I know how editors are. An editor walked by and was like, that's surfing. What are you doing? Delete it, edit, print it, run it. And then that and it took ten seconds for that moment to happen in the editing room. But its impact has lasted decades. I know you. I know you did the deep dive on this for sure. I mean, I, I thought it was great. You know, every you know, from Butch and the magazine to Tex and to all the different uh, manufacturers, East and West Coast. Uh, what was one of the biggest surprises that you unearthed in your your investigation <laughs> into the sport? How big the family really was. <laughs> I mean, it felt like every turn. Time I took a corner, or took a plane ride, or I mean, it was it was another town, another story, another start, you know. And there's, you know, it's it was hard for me to actually track down the origins. So I mean, I felt like I I used the Hawaiians and the Duke to take the easy way out. I'm like, okay, this is obvious. You guys were arguing about the 70s. This is way farther back, <laughs> and it well, was it, hard. It that's was, I actually, you know, what's funny is I, I mentioned that I way back when when uh, during my tenure at NBC Sports, I I did a a, a segment with Tax and Beaker was in the in it. It was a you know about a seven minute segment. I never heard about uh, the well. I know about you know the the, the pipo boards, but I never heard the the Tax Duke connection at all. Which is it, it was just kind of right right after watching Waterman last night. It's so cool. 
And it's really surreal. And as I've been telling people this whole weekend, having the Waterman, having, you know, the birth of Endless Summer, and even having, you know, the Jake Burton story, all these stories. I mean, we have Burton boards. We have Pipo boards. We have Duke Kamanamoko. We have it all in this film. And, it, you know, he, they all inspired us. And, you know, it's, it's really one of those things, like when I'm looking like you're saying, it's the family was there and the stories were there. And people ask, like, why would, why would you interview so many people? And it's because there was zero encyclopedias. There was zero knowledge. There was zero real resources that literally was like, how do I fact check? And I don't know if any filmmakers know, as a filmmaker, it's one of the most important things. How do we put something in the film and know it's not a lie, especially if we weren't there? And a lot of those older guys, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I'd call them after a cool interview and be, hey, this is what's going on. Is this true? Is this really happening? Is this a real story? And some stories were negated, but a lot of them weren't. And, you know, it's one of those things that I think in all action sports, I was talking to Ben earlier, that I feel like documentary filmmakers, not to type bad on any other stories. I love all stories. I mean, Torn, I mean, Buried. Look at the stories that we've had on this lineup. And I was talking to Ben. I said, I feel that documentary filmmakers in action sports are literally slapped with so much content and so much stories it's evolving how documentaries are made and not people I'm not saying how they're made the tone of the movie and how it moves so fast and how it has that upbeat tone i feel like the action sports realm has this genre that it's creating this like tone of energy and i don't know if you agree in all these films that's so weirdly similar and it's just the stoke the power of the stoke like you guys have been saying all week yeah, no but I, it, it it comes through and i and you know being that this is our you know the last day of this year's coast film festival and it was a kind of a local a local day paying homage to the greg McGilvray's uh, filmmakers such as yourself it's it it definitely belongs here and what's great about a film like this once it's made it'll be out there people can get their eyes on it and they can learn a lot like i as much as i thought i'd known about skimboarding and the amount of people that i know um, yeah, learning, <laughs> learning every day. So thank you for that. Oh, you yeah. know, it was my pleasure. And as I was saying, it's I encourage filmmakers out there to really look outside the box, you know, do projects that they're not so quickly connected to, you know, don't say, oh, I'm not I don't feel comfortable doing that project because I'm not involved. Get involved. As you know, it's like be a part of the, you know, the solution. And, you know, a lot of people have been saying this weekend that the destination is the journey. And I can't agree with that more, you know, looking back and seeing Dick's story. I'll be honest, I, I, you know, I, I owed a lot to my parents. I'll be honest. We did a yeah. publicity stunt, and they gave me 100,000 finger flyer miles. And I told them if they gave me those miles, I'd see the world. One month later, we had 55 sponsors, and I, I didn't come home for eight months. And I traveled wow. to over 20 countries. So it was... As I tell people, it's it's an experience I'll never forget. It made me who I am. I'm a very different person now. And it's, you know, and it, it brought me to the people I am with today. And it's it's one of those things and like I'm weirdly enough, I'm working on a new movie on a kidnapping. And it's um called Where's Marcus? And it's um it's completely polar opposite of this. So it's, well, it's I, interesting. I, I, skimboarding and kidnapping, yeah, <laughs> two, entirely different categories. But I just wanted to, you know, okay. I just, I feel like it's any story. As I said, mm. filmmakers out there don't feel like just because a story isn't necessarily personal, you can make it personal and you can get that connection no matter where it is. And, um, you know, uh, another film I was talking about was the, man, I'm thinking of the one about the, the porpoise. Um, oh, the vaquito. The vaquito, yeah, thank yeah. you. And man, that story is crazy. If any of you guys didn't see that short online, please check it out. Yeah. And the whole story of the tortuga fish and all that, it's just, I was just sitting there's here like, There's longer form versions, but I, what, what was really cool about that too is I think they had a nice twist um, by going through the perspective of the two artists and the silk screeners, but by by virtue of what their connection was to do what they do, but do it with, you know, to find a, a purpose, yeah. uh, but then also then tell the story of all the people within the Sea Shepherd. Yeah, like, 
Very, very cool. And I just want to say yeah. thanks to the, you guys. You've done an amazing week. This has been a crazy week. We're, I won't, we're, not, we're, not, <laughs> we're not done yet. We got, I'm not going to write you off that. I believe Dick, no, Dick Metz will be doing Birth of Endless Summer tonight, uh, Lost Prophets, and Into the Great, I think, uh, Into the Grand Canyon, Greg McGilvery's movie. So amazing. It's a big Laguna Beach night with uh, other filmmakers. So we, we wish you luck on your journey, because I know you're going to get to the destination with the, the kidnapping movie. We can't wait to have you back with that. How about a round of applause for Anthony here? Thank you, sir. And we're shooting it in 12K. Okay. So I hope you can up the... Proje- no, I'm just kidding. We'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll send an HD we'll version. We'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. Okay. But thank you so much, man. Yeah, really so just remember... It. Yeah, thank you. Wait. <laughs>